Tim and I did this epic road trip in the spring of 2017. Yes, the adjective epic is required to be stated. I even made t-shirts. And it was aptly named Tim and Gina's Driving Adventure, as we did have a few car-related issues in our turbocharged, fuel-injected 1972 Plymouth Duster. Tim did a video on the car aspect, mostly modifications, but mentions most of the other issues. You know, fires and exploding batteries, the usual. There's a link in the description for his video. This video is more about the trip, and I'll get to the sites and stops, but I'll start with the planning. These are the resources that I used. Going through the books and writing down definite must-sees and ones that would be nice if we have the time. Our trip was pretty rushed since we started from North Idaho. The getting to Chicago and back from Santa Monica adds some days. We were away from home a total of 19 days. I'm concentrating on the Chicago to Santa Monica portion, although we did see some things on the way, like Mount Rushmore, the Pioneer Auto Show in Murdo, South Dakota, the Corn Palace in Mitchell, South Dakota, and the world's largest cyclist in Sparta, Wisconsin. We stayed in Oak Park and took the L into Chicago. Our first day was a half day, so we started with Chicago pizza, as you do, at Lou Malnati's, and then went to the Art Institute for some culture. Living in a small town, that's a perk of a vacation like this. I knew I wanted to see the Monet's and Degas, but I was actually really impressed with the armory portion of the museum as well. There really is something for everyone at this very large museum. Then on to Grant Park to see the Buckingham Fountain and hey, a great lake. The fountain was on my the cover of my seventh grade science book and of course the Married with Children TV show and I was quite taken with it and wanted to see it in person. I'm not going to do the math on how many years it took me to see it. The next day was a full day in Chicago. The official start of the route is debatable. The original start in Chicago was moved due to the original road being turned into one way the wrong direction. The folksy start is the diner Lou Mitchell's, which is more than likely across the street from the original start. After breakfast, we popped into Union Station and then took in some cityscapes on our walk to the Field Museum of Natural History. This was mainly to see Sue, the T-Rex, as we had watched a documentary on her discovery and were eager to see her. She has since been moved and had an upgrade in appearance based on discovery of anatomy, so I'll guess we'll have to go back again someday for pizza and to see Sue. We did as the Chicagans do, or at least as we're told they do, and grabbed a Chicago-style hot dog conveniently located outside of the Field Museum, and then meandered over to the Shedd Aquarium. We started out the actual drive the next morning, stopping in Berwyn, Illinois for the first Route 66 signage, and then Gardner, Illinois, for the spotting of our first Route 66 road shield, which was very exciting for us. We were enamored with the charming community-run refurbished gas station in Odell, Illinois. It was to be torn down, but the Route 66 Association spoke with the townspeople and acquired sponsors. Residents now take turns manning the store. We saw the first of the Illinois Giants in Wilmington and ate lunch at a place that let me graffiti the wall. They also gave me some very informative Illinois route resources, which was great since the visitor center in Berwyn hadn't opened for the day when we went through. We stopped in Pontiac, Illinois, where we did the official photo op at the museum and convinced Tim to get in the route themed car on the sidewalk. He refused to have his picture taken in the cheetah print themed one. And then on to our overnight in St. Louis. In Missouri, we were more excited than was probably warranted to see a real-life cardinal at the Museum of Transportation. If there is a train lover in your group, this is the place to go. We made the stop for the Chrysler Turbine, but there were definitely more trains than cars, and it was pretty cool. A quick Ted's Custard Concrete ice cream was the thing to do, and then on to a bucket list item of mine, Miramech Caverns. This was cool, <laughs> literally. However, they were recovering from a flood, so even though the fresh fudge sign was illuminated, they didn't have any. That's rude. <laughs> Something to know is that it is privately owned, so even though the Dosen's Wear Park Ranger-like uniforms, they are not, and the family who owns it appear to be young earthers, so everything in there is thousands of years old. It was a good tour, and I can see that pre-flood or post-flood cleanup, there would have been more things to see and do on the property that would eat up more time. We hit our favorite place in Missouri, Spencer. We were driving along the route and I saw a route sign on a road we passed. It turned out we went to the 1929 road that just looped around to the one we were on, but Spencer was on it. 
with this cute little bridge. The town is this grouping of conjoined buildings. We were the only ones there and took a photo opportunity in the late afternoon, which became my favorite car pick of the trip. Next is the whopping 13 miles through Kansas, but it's enough for me to put on my visited states list. This place has changed hands several times and has been renamed. It usually has on the route in the name, at least the last three or so owners. Their Totator is down as the inspiration for Tomator in the movie Cars. In Oklahoma, we stumbled upon the Packard Museum in an old filling station, which wasn't on our list, saw the Catoosa Whale, which was a roadside attraction built as an anniversary gift to the designer's wife, originally a slide and swimming hole, and went on to the National 66 Museum in Clinton, Oklahoma, and a stop at a fixture on the route in Eric, Oklahoma. Shamrock, Texas, and the U Drop In was a pleasant surprise to us. We would like to see it lit with neon someday. The Cadillac Ranch, with Cadillacs that claim to be at the same angle as the Great Pyramid in Giza, was disappointing mostly due to the paint can trash. It was kind of sad. Tim refused to carry spray paint, but I found one that could have been mine. Go Pies. Our last stop in Texas in the pouring rain was the Midpoint Cafe in Adrian. When we went to Midpoint, uh, they only served food until 2 and coffee and pie until they close at 3. We were there at 1.50, so managed to eat, but they would have been hangry bad if we had missed it. New Mexico was a little skint on items. We stayed in Tucumcari and ate at the root restaurant famous for being in the shape of a sombrero. Definitely not for the food. Funny, the best Mexican food we had on this trip was in Wyoming. We went to the Route 66 Auto Museum in Santa Rosa and then headed to Arizona. I never considered myself a desert landscape person, but the Painted Desert won me over a bit. We did a quick drive through the Petrified Forest and Painted Desert and then exploded the car battery. So that was fun, but we made it to Hallwork where we crossed off another bucket list item, staying in a wigwam motel. No, Tim, it's not a cozy cone. You can't back into it. We went to Winslow, Arizona, so we could take part in the Eagle Song and stand on the corner. A quick stop at the Jack Rabbit Trading Post and then on to Williams, Arizona, where we spent two nights to take the train to the Grand Canyon and celebrated our fifth wedding anniversary. Did a little bit of a splurge on the way back with Luxury Dome class, then on to the special place of Seligman. Angel and his brother Juan are credited with the resurgence of Route 66 nostalgia. There were five tour buses when we got there, stopping on the way back from the tours of the Grand Canyon, so I guess they were successful. Fortunately, just leaving, so ten minutes later it felt like we had the place to ourselves. It's a tourist trap, but a completely necessary stop. We went on to Grand Canyon Cavern in Peach Springs, Arizona, a dry cavern and a pretty rundown tourist attraction with a tap tour full of dad jokes, but they have pie. Stopped at Cool Springs, Arizona before attempting the winding narrow road into Oatman. Rule four of our relationship agreement is no killing each other. So I'm repeating rule four, rule four. Tim says you can close your eyes. <laughs> okay, as I cover my eyes with my hands and it actually helped. And look, we're still married and wild donkeys in Oatman. We were thinking about stopping in Kingman for the night, but were there pretty early, so decided to press on to San Bernardino Rialto, long day, and our last day on the route, also a wigwam. The person responsible for the majority of these was amazed at the success of the one in Holbrook, the only one that wasn't his franchisee, so decided to put one on the route to get in the action. The next morning, we finished at the Santa Monica Pier. This was stressful, with LA traffic and some car issues. It actually took hours to get there just due to the traffic. The car issues just made it more stressful. They didn't add time. Hours. We were going to go to Santa Barbara for lunch, but ended up eating lunch at the pier since it took so long to get there. Of course, we had a couple more days to get home, and I had to stop at the Jelly Belly factory in Northern California for a Jelly Belly-shaped burger. Our biggest mistake? Uh, not allowing time. I had a vague idea of overnight stops we needed to make in order to get to our Grand Canyon train trip reservation, and it added some pressure. I tried to keep it to four to five hours per day of driving once we got to the route, but in some areas, that's not enough. Going the fastest way, Chicago to St. Louis, is about four and a half hours. On the route, it took us about nine hours, 
So really planning for the things you stumble upon is very important. The route is definitely not a straight line. It is also sometimes hard to know if you're still on it. Uh, if we knew we were off of it for time's sake, we would punch in the next destination that we knew was on the route and locate it from there. The binder. If you're a planner like me, not anal, Tim, planner, sealable pouches for receipts and brochures, a daily drive log for places and expenses, any set hotels with phone numbers, addresses, confirmation numbers, list of places to see or do or eat for each drive day. Um, if budgeting, envelopes for cash. I did by state. Um, so that's about it. I hope you enjoyed this and it's somewhat informative. We're planning a Pacific Coast Highway trip, so I may do a video of that when that comes. Thank you very much for watching.